Hi, everybody. It's your best friend, Sarah. And um, I just wanted to read you this. I was like, I don't have anything to say at the top of this show. And then um, I got a text this morning, early this morning, from my friend in New York, Sam Cedar, uh, old lover of mine from the early 90s, uh, now currently my, uh, like, a brother to me. And um, let's see here. I got this <laughs> text from him. And it goes. Also, check out, by the way, his podcast, The Majority Report, with Sam Cedar. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, daily podcast. And uh, this is the text I got this morning, and it goes like this. Every weekday morning, I walk to work. It's a 35-minute walk, and I love it. Last week, I had watched a YouTube Tim Ferriss episode, and I thought I should start listening to him again. It's been years. I saw you did an episode recently, so I figured I'd check it out. I'm walking down Flatbush Avenue about 15 minutes from work, passing Barclay Center, and I am listening to you and waiting to hear my name as I do, you know, whenever I tune into anything you're doing, interviews, movies, photo shoots. <laughs> and suddenly I am hit with the strongest compulsion to shit that I've ever had in decades. I start to waddle down Flatbush frantically and make my way into the mall, a mall at Barclays, praying to find a toilet. I am too focused on clenching my asshole so I don't shit myself to turn off your talking about Jesus' magic and second-guessing the audience, and I am racing through the mall, sweating behind my mask. After I find that the McDonald's bathroom is closed, I make my way up to Target, waddle to the bathroom, grabbing at the button on my pants, and got seven-eighths of my diarrhea in the toilet. All the while, you are talking about SNL or basketball. It was a nightmare. So anyway... You were on my mind. Hope all is well. So I'm dying laughing at 7 o'clock this morning. And I text him and I'm like, can I read this on my podcast? And he's like, then he writes, well, maybe change 7 eighths to 8 eighths. And I go, okay, yeah. I'll say you got 8 eighths of your diarrhea in the toilet. <laughs> and he's like, all right, just say it. Oh, you know... So many things divide us in this world, but one thing that really brings us all together is funny, horrifying stories about shitting. And that's my, uh, that's all I got for you. And now it's time to listen to some voicemails. Let's go to some voicemails. You left me a message. Now I'm playing it for the world. Let's hear some voicemails. Hi, Sarah. This is Ben calling from Melbourne in Australia. So a few months ago, mm -hmm. my wife and I had a baby, beautiful baby girl. Um, and it's been really nice listening to your podcast. Uh, some of the comments you've sort of um, said about raising girls. <laughs> <laughs> that's her there um, like the comment about how we shouldn't say to them that they can do anything because it would never occur to them that they couldn't I thought that was really interesting so just wondering if you have any other advice or maybe things that you wish your dad knew when you were growing up that you can uh, tell me and give me a bit of a leg up here um, so thanks a lot love the podcast Schleppy I'm winding down my voicemail <laughs> oh that's awesome I mean just hearing you say back, you know, don't tell them they can be anything or they can do anything because it wouldn't occur to them that they couldn't. That's when you're specifically talking to girls. Like, girls can do anything, you know? But, I mean, of course, raise your kids whatever gender they are or genderless that they can do anything. But just, it was just kind of like, girls can do anything. It's like, why? Could they not before? Or, you know, like... Um, but the first thing that pops into my head, I, you know... I would say is teach your daughter to apologize whenever she is sorry and no other time. You know what I mean? It's so important. And it seems for some reason so hard for people to apologize when they are sorry. And it should be much easier. I mean, it, it feels good. It makes the person you're apologizing to feel good. It... Uh, you're better for it now. But besides apologizing when you're sorry, which is incredibly important to, to teach your children, whether they are girl, boy, or, or not, 
or non-binary, hmm, um, that it's important to apologize when you're sorry and, you know, and that it, that's a wonderful thing to do. But besides apologizing when you're sorry, girls tend to learn somehow to use sorry for just existing or for speaking out or for excelling or for anything to placate the egos around them. Um, I, th I think it's a survival mechanism, literally. You know, we, we figure out at an early age how to survive. And, and I think that's one of them for a lot of girls. But I also think it creates, a, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way of not being taken at our word. So, yeah. I also think it's incredibly important to speak at face value, to say what you actually mean and uh, not a watered down, meeker version that hits softer to the ear. I think it's important to also receive what people say at face value and not try to not um, be a party to this, you know, what does he really mean or what does she really mean or, you know, um, to 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 take people at their word and then let them adjust to that, then decoding this, what people actually mean. Do you know what I mean? Does that seem silly to you? Diane, do you know what I mean? I just, um, sorry, I didn't mean to put the pressure on you. <laughs> I just, I'm just like seeing if this is connecting. Just that we're, you know, kind of all used to playing this game of she or he said this, but what do they really mean? And then when people ask, when people speak directly and say what they honestly feel, um, people think they must be on the spectrum or, <laughs> you know, like have Asperger's or something. And, you know, which may be true, but is, um, is it not stronger and clearer to say what you absolutely mean and stop doing this thing where you say what, you know, where what you say must be decoded? Anyway, uh, that's my advice from this childless woman. Um... Not really particularly like raising a girl specific, but kind of. So there you go. I hope that was helpful. Here's some ads for ya. Imagine the best orgasm or sex you ever had. Now imagine that it could be even better with products that were designed to naturally enhance sexual pleasure and give you access to bigger and better orgasms. What? Solo or with a partner? You know what I love about these products is they make them with, uh, the, their sex oil is made with coconut oil, which I approve of. I was told about coconut oil as a... Uh, sexual lubricant many years ago from a uh, long silver-haired woman at a health food store and uh, they're smart to use it. What is an arousal oil though? Awaken is like a juicy warm-up that helps you get really turned on, increasing your pleasure and deepening your orgasms with a partner or solo. Awaken uses CBD and warming, sensation-inducing organic botanicals that enhance arousal, sensitivity, pleasure, access to orgasm, and help with any discomfort. And best of all, Awaken just turns you on. So yes, you have my permission to try this. I fully endorse you to go ahead and treat yourself to more deeper, fuller pleasure wherever you can find it as often as possible. And you can start with a bottle of Foria. Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting foriawellness.com slash Sarah or use code Sarah at checkout. That's F-O-R-I-A wellness.com forward slash Sarah for 20% off your first order. I recommend trying their Awaken Arousal Oil and Sex Oil. You will thank me later. Article, article. You know, I recently got a new house. An article helped my space look beautiful. This direct-to-consumer company combines the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. I have all my uh, living room chairs. My dining room chairs are from article um my bed frame 
in my um, guest room is from Article. They I get so many compliments. They're stunning. They're beautiful. And they were inexpensive. Article's team of designers focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. It's inspired by a variety of modern design aesthetics like mid-century, Scandinavian, industrial, and bohemian. You'll be impressed by their fair prices, too. You save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Article is able to keep their prices low by cutting out the middleman and selling directly to you. So no showrooms, no salespeople, no retail markups, none of that stuff. Shipping is available across the USA and Canada and is free in orders over $999. Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Go to article.com slash Sarah and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That is article.com slash Sarah to get 50 bucks off your first purchase of $100 or more. And we're back. Hi, Sarah. Um, I had a question about your voice. Um, I would say that you have like a naturally cute voice. Um, and some women I've noticed, you know, will adopt a cute type of voice, um, because either consciously or subconsciously they've learned that that's the more attractive type of voice for a woman. Um, and other women just naturally have a cute voice. And then maybe some of them feel that it works against them when they want to be taken seriously. And anyway, I was just wondering if you feel like your voice has worked for you or against you, or if maybe you just don't think about it at all. <laughs> okay, thanks. I I don't think about it at all, but yeah, it, I'm sure it has worked both for me and against me throughout my uh, life and career. Um, I'm aware of my voice really from like, people's reaction to my voice more than my own um, hearing it myself. Although when I hear myself talk, I'm just like, what is that noise? But I've gotten used to it. It's I know it's very nasal. I know it must be unique because if I've got, you know, a hat on and a mask and, you know, like there's no reason anyone would recognize me and they don't. But then I say like, do you know where the milk aisle is or what? And I don't ever ask for the milk aisle, by the way. I think I know where the milk aisle is almost in almost every store. But say I'm going, uh, hey, where do you have a wheat germ? There's a good one. Where's your miso? Um, people recognize me from my voice. So it must be unique. Uh, or when people do impressions of me, I'm like, I know I must sound like that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, and yes, I do think that women, that all people actually play roles when they're around different people and their voice changes. You know, it, when they're in with people that they have different dynamics with. You you speak, your your voice sounds different probably when you talk to your mom um, then when you talk to someone you're madly in love with and when you talk to someone you're not madly in love with and, you know, you are with your family, then with your, your friends and, you know, at your job, you have a, an authority with certain people maybe in your voice. This is very natural and, and everybody experiences it. But certainly like um, my friend Josh is obsessed with that show 90 Day Fiance, which I'm not really familiar with, but he's shown me, he sent me clips and just how amazing it is that like when a woman is with the other women, I don't know if it's like The Bachelor or something, but you know, she's like, she talks like this and she's blah, 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 blah. And then when she talks to the guy, she's like, baby, baby, I can't believe it. And that's how he talks to his um, newborn son now, which is driving his husband crazy. But uh, but it that's a real extreme and it's pretty wild. And I do think that it's, there's something with some women who do that baby voice thing and it's it does mean something like uh if i were a psychologist that studies this stuff i bet um i would find you know there are i used to have a joke that i'm not proud of now something about women who talk with a baby voice tend to have been molested that's not the joke i don't remember the joke but it was like based on that conceit 
which is horrible, of course. But I do think that there is maybe something to it. And and I will say that when men do a baby voice, it's a, that is a... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a game changer, like a no way. Deal breaker. Deal, thank you, Raj. <laughs> thank you, Raj. As I my dementia sets in... Uh, I, I count on Raj and Diana to, um, that's a deal breaker for me. Also, you know, people's voices tend to naturally go up when they are public speaking, you know? So that's why you have to kind of, you know, before I, I public speaking obviously comes naturally to me at this point. I got my 10,000 hours in, certainly more, but, um, and I've got that voice where I always sound like I have a cold too, which I, I find unappealing. But because your voice goes up when you are nervous or speaking publicly, before I go out and, and do and perform, um, I say, <laughs> this is embarrassing. First I say, as you know, I'm Jane Pomeroy, which is like, I don't know, to me, just like a very sophisticated name I made up of a woman who speaks clearly and without nasality. I made that word up. I'm, J hi, I'm, <clears throat> hi, I'm Jane Pomeroy. I'm Jane Pomeroy. That kind of centers me. And then I just say the word poise. And then all bets are off, obviously, because I talk like this. But it for some reason, it just gets me to center. So I don't end up going, blah, blah, blah. Like a crazy person. Um, that's all I got for you. I hope that was at all satisfying. Poise. Jane Pomeroy. What else? <laughs> Good grief. Hey, Sarah. This is Anthony from Texas. I wanted to get your thoughts on custody arrangements post-divorce. When I went through my divorce, something that really bothered me was that the expectation was laid out that it would be a big ask to try to get 50-50 time in a conservative county as a dad and that courts are pro-mom and that for a mom to not get primary custody, she would have to have just extreme issues like be a drug addict with lots of proof for her not to have the majority of the time with the kids and have primary custody. And I just think that's such bullshit. I think parents deserve to have equal time with their kids and that kids deserve that equal time. And I just think it's such an archaic way of thinking that dads aren't capable of parenting just as much as moms and that they should only have their kids every other weekend and then one night a week and then, you know, yeah, don't just forget the typical schedule. <laughs> and it's something that has really bothered me. And I just want to get your thoughts on it. Thanks. Bye. Well, you should absolutely fight for it. If you have the work schedule to care for them half of the time and, and uh, your ex also does, you know, that's great. And, and I, I, you know, I, I'm guessing this is not an amicable divorce if that isn't something she would want for you and for her children and for herself. Um, I think the difficulty in getting... Um, 50 50 custody for a dad or beyond comes from another time you know um it's the idea that the mother tends to get custody because she stays home and raise the kids and then the father is goes out and works and is the breadwinner and after divorce he still is the breadwinner and she still cares for the kids because those were the the jobs they had and you know life isn't quite like that um anymore in most cases families take on all different shapes and uh, look all sorts of ways and um you know i my parents got divorced in the late 70s and my dad got they had joint custody and uh i did not enjoy as a kid going between houses i really really didn't like it I needed one home I wanted to be I wanted my room you know and uh that happened to be at my mom's you know my sisters moved to their to my dad's and that was you know they probably felt like that was their home 
you know, I, it is not enjoyable as a kid navigating school and all this scary new stuff and um, having to like bring an overnight bag to school because it's your dad's night. And, you know, listen, that's how it is. And kids are extremely adaptable, but just because they're adaptable doesn't mean you need to put them in that position. And that what I'm pitching is something that is, I have friends that are doing this and I am not married. I don't have kids. I, I have no right to say this is what you should do, but know that it's an option, which is uh, they do something called bird nesting, okay? Um, they were married. They got divorced. They lived in a little apartment in, in Brooklyn. And uh, they what they did was they bought a little studio apartment about a block away. The kids don't travel. They don't have to move. They don't have to go back and forth anyway. Their home is their home. It's the parents that go back and forth. And I like that. The, you know, uh, the mom will be in the studio apartment living her life. Dad will be home with the kids. And then when it's mom's time with them, he goes and stays at the studio apartment and she comes and lives at home with the kids. And I just really like that, you know, just meaning like the kids don't have to change their lives and be mobile. The parents do. And it's tricky and it's probably inconvenient. Um, but I think that's better than it being tricky and inconvenient for your children. But also, fuck me. I am living my best life with no kids. So, uh so, you know, you got to make that decision for yourself. But that's my two cents. Here's some ads. Curology. You know, I was experiencing dry skin and I also have like melasma stains. And then I heard about Curology. My producer, Diana, has been getting their shipments since the start of the pandemic and recommended it to me. And it's great. Curology is game changing custom skincare made for you by a dermatology provider. They will create a custom prescription cream just for you, for your specific goals, whether that's tackling acne, uh, clogged pores, skin texture, dark spots, hi, uh, fine lines, or something else. You start by taking a short online skin quiz and uploading photos, and if it's a good fit, they'll ship you your formula right to your door. It even has your name on the bottle. I took their short skin quiz and matched with a dermatology provider who helped create my custom formula. No office visits needed. Clearer, healthier skin does not happen overnight, but with Curology, they really set you on the right path. And because your skin changes, Curology checks in to see how you're doing and can adjust the ingredients in your formula if needed to get you to your goals. In my box, I received a cleanser, moisturizer, and emergency spot patches. The patches are my favorite. They, um, they're so easy to use, and they stop you from picking at your pimples. They're the best. I do love those stickers. So get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at Curology.com slash Sarah. Just pay five bucks for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash Sarah to get your free 30-day trial. Cancel anytime. Prescription subject to consultation. Hey, Sarah. My name's David. I'm sitting here with my fiance, Chris, and we were just watching reruns um, of I Love America, and you are so talented Aww. and so funny. <laughs> but we had a request because we're feeling left out because recently comics have been so sensitive and we miss gay jokes. And I would love if you could just tell us some gay jokes just so we feel included. And so it's funny. And so we can laugh. <laughs> I love you. Anyhow, that's all. We love you. Bye. This feels like a trap. <laughs> but I'll, you know, the only thing that pops in my head, I mean, of course, I am guilty of, I'm sure, making gay jokes. And on the Sarah Silverman program, we had Stephen Bryan. The comedy around that didn't usually tend towards that, but it did sometimes. Uh but one joke, it does still make me laugh, but that I told at the MTV Movie Awards in 2007. You know, I was making jokes about all the different movies. You requested this. I just want to say, I don't, like, I'm, 
but I, I will t- t- retell it. And it was something about, it wasn't even a joke. It was more like a throwaway line. I was roasting the movies from that year. And then when it came to that movie, 300, I said that it was titled after how gay it was on a scale from one to 10. <laughs> Are you laughing? Um, that joke was by request. Kind of. Anyway, um, I love you for calling in, and that's hilarious. And uh, what else? Hi, Sarah. This is Alex. Big fan of the podcast. Quick question about melasma. I am intersex, and I was born with a condition called um, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. And because of that, I've been on estrogen therapy since I was about 18. And melasma has recently become quite a problem. I'm also right. allergic to basically everything in every kind of sunscreen I've ever tried. Oh, so those aren't really an option. Fuck. But I'm wondering what you use to correct the damage um, on your face from the sun due to the melasma, sunspots, the discoloration, if you've had any success with any specific products. Um, again, love the podcast and uh, love everything you do. Bye. Hi soul sister in melasma that's awful i'm so sorry and i you know i would say you know there are products like meloderm um <clears throat> which i think is thought of as like the best to fade melasma um and and curology which is a sponsor will make you um something that that for it that um make sure it has nothing that you're allergic to and they they like will make a specific oh curology i wonder if that comes from like curate like they curate for you the perfect and it has the word cure in it that's very clever anyway um <clears throat> they they made something for me and it has that hyd- hydroquinone in it some people want that for melasma some people don't it can be drying. Maybe it's like just what you need though. So you just have to try different things. But for me, the key is not getting melasma. So, you know, I've worn a bandana on sunny days way before we were wearing masks, you know. Um, stay out of the sun. So I slab so much sunscreen on, but if you can't do that, maybe there's a sunscreen. I mean, you've got a library, a computer in your pocket, you know to see if there's a sunscreen you can use and use it just straight up zinc you know like stuff I'll sometimes I'll just make like a very opaque like Fu Manchu must is that okay to say Fu Manchu mustache what's the one that goes like this (laughs) I just like making Raj go up to the Uh, mic I don't know if that's a Fu Manchu I thought the Fu Manchu has this this too oh yeah no what's the like a sam elliott hulk hogan has one. handlebar no well you know uh, the the sam elliott hulk hogan i'll just put like a thick white thing but you know you can't always do that you should only do that really around your friends or strangers but maybe not in all situations like a full mustache just like covering my whole upper lip and maybe go down on the sides just for fashion thank you though raj and um, yeah, the best thing is to just avoid getting it if you can. And that's like bandana over your face, sunbrella. Get yourself a sunbrella. Is it cool? No, <laughs> but you won't get melasma. And just stay, keep your fucking face out of the sun. Even if you're just, you're outside, but you're turning your back to the sun, you know? All that stuff is just important. I'm a. Uh, I'm just a nightmare for people on like um, sets where we're shooting outside and I'm like, not the star, but I'm like, I can't be in the sun. <laughs> like it's like six months to fade a, a dark brown mustache stain from melasma. They don't understand. And that's all I got for you. What else? Hey, Sarah. My name is Dave. I live in Orange County, California. Uh, first, want to thank you for your wonderful podcast. I have found myself now hopelessly addicted to it. And what I love about it is your just refreshing take on life. Uh, it is a mix of a very balanced perspective, common sense, pragmatism, and it's just all seems to be rooted in just complete 
uh, honesty and authenticity. And I just feel like in today's world, uh, this is the beacon of light that we should all be attracted to. So um, thank you for, for doing that. My question to you is uh, I have um, reached near my mid fifties. Uh, I think we are similar in age and I found myself really thinking about my own mortality a lot, the legacy I want to leave behind professionally and with my family um, how much time I might have left in my life, the reality that my life is going to end at some point, uh, and uh, really what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I wanted to know if you have similar thoughts, if you uh, don't think about it, uh, or if you've been thinking about it for a while, and uh, how do you um, come to terms with all that? Thank you. I don't think about it a lot, probably more than... I used to, obviously. I have friends just uh, dying a lot, and um, but of all ages. And um, yeah, mortality is, is, it's inevitable, right? You know, we all die, and uh, I accept it, as it is uh, easy to accept when the inevitable ha- seems farther away. But... Uh, you know, boy, it it is scary. And I remember when my mom, you know, she was sick for a really long time. And um, in the beginning, she was like, do not resuscitate. You know, like the, was it DNR? You know, oh God, yeah. Like if I'm, you know, don't like resuscitate if I'm supposed to, if I'm dying and it's like not going to be a quality of life. And, you know, I think that's easy for us all to like fill out early on or when when death seems far away you know or she would say god you know when i get hard when i can't take care of myself just put me in a home you know whatever she does but when that moment comes you feel differently and i i'll never forget my mom was really weak it was towards the end and the doctor came in and she was talking to my mom about do not resuscitate. And my mom had changed her mind about it, you know? And she said, well, I want you to try. And um, she said, but, you know, Bethann, it would, you know, it would, we'd probably be breaking your ribs and, you know, your quality of life would be not good. And, but my mom, because our instinct is to live and it was so, she was, close to dying and she she wanted to fight to live you know and and it was such an odd thing trying to convince her otherwise I you know I mean you know we all say oh I hope I die at you know 95 and I'm you know but then when you're 94 you're not going oh I hope I die at 95 you 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 want to live so I watched her wanting to live, no matter how uncomfortable or or what the quality of that life was. All of a sudden, it was different because it was right in front of her. Anyway, that's that was depressing. But yeah, I think all we can do is um, you make fucking sure to the best of your ability that you are living the life you want to live, this one life. Um. That's what I think, like this fear of mortality, it's, it's, it's happening. Whether it's far away or not far away, we don't know. Most of us don't know when we're going to die or how we're going to die. And I wonder if like, you know how like when people are dying, they tend to take, they tend to suddenly have this kind of wisdom and perspective, you know, sometimes. I know there's the opposite of what I was just saying about my mom, but like, I wonder if when you know how you're going to die, you're sick and it's fatal and this is it, that there's any kind of peace to at least kind of knowing the unknowable. I don't know. That wasn't the case with my mother at all, but, um, but it, you do see that in movies. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it doesn't seem to be a good use of your time on this planet to be worried about how you're going to die or, or that you are going to die or that we're all going to die. 
but to use that knowledge that we are all going to die to make sure that you live the life that you want to live. I feel like I, I, someone called in with a similar thing and I was saying a similar answer. So I don't know, but this is what we talk about now. I mean, I think everyone's having existential crises with the state of the world as it is. Was that helpful? Let me add a fart noise just to lighten it up. Well, that was hard to do in the mic. Let me just do it this way. All right, what else? Hi, Sarah. Leaving you this message from Brooklyn, New York. Woo! Love the podcast. Grateful that you do it. And I just was moved to send a voicemail because you had said on an episode of the podcast that Murray Hill was the first trans comedian that you had ever met. And actually, Murray is not trans. That is just a character. So I just wanted to correct the record on that. But Murray's house apartment did just burn down recently in a fire. So maybe people want to donate to their GoFundMe, which can be found on their Instagram page. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Thank you. Um, wow. Thank you for that correction. I, you know, I only know Murray from comedy. I, I don't, you know, um, so I don't know Murray outside of comedy. But great. Thanks for the correction and the opportunity to say, hey, Murray Hill's apartment building burned down and there's a GoFundMe for everyone in the apartment building. Um, So chip in. There you go. Uh, What else? Hi, Sarah. This is Jody and Julia from the band Smith Smith. Um, we came across a tongue twister that we wanted, uh, to share with you. We'd love for you to try it out. Here it goes. Rory, the warrior and Roger, the warrior were reared wrongly in a rural brewery. Good luck. I think this comes from when a town and I would do play video games online, um, there was one t- time where we were thinking of tongue twisters. <laughs> I don't know. That's a deep cut. But um, Rory the Warrior. Rory the Warrior and Roger the Warrior were reared wrongly in rural brewery. Roger. Roger. They must mean Raj. I think they mean you, Raj. That's actually... Not short for Roger. It's short for Rajan. 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 Fucking white supremacists. Smith Smith. Just kidding. That's not even a white. We have a black Roger on Stupid Petrix who goes by Raj, which means we have to think of another name for you, which I'm assuming should just be the Raj man. Since uh, that's what you call yourself on Twitter. Um, especially when you invoke a sick burn. Raj is very funny on Twitter, and he says, you've been burned by the Raj man. After not, I'm going to be honest, the sickest burns in the world. (laughs) Uh, What else? Hey, Sarah. It is your faithful protector from the shadows, the STL Batman. In St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I got a question for you. When was the last time you had to use the word shunda? Just curious. I've always heard it as shanda. It's a shanda. But it's actually either because it's Yiddish. You can spell it any way it sounds to your ear. Um, I don't know when I've used it. I, I think I have maybe never used the word shanda. But just for our listeners at home who may not know, a Shonda, a Shonda is like a, a, a disgrace or a great shame, especially not always, but it could be used just about, you know, meaning a shame. But it it's it's also like if it's bad for the Jews, that's especially like Epstein is a Shonda to the Jews. Like he's just 
a shame to the Jews. Jeffrey, not Juan. Did I say Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah. Um, Bernie Madoff is an excellent example because he's like, um, that's when they say like, he's considered a Shonda for the Goyam. And a Shonda for the Goyam, meaning like, he confirms the most hurtful Jewish stereotypes thereby doing double damage. You know, he's a Jew who dishonors Jews by not only doing something bad, but by doing something that confirms the worst stereotypes and fears of others about Jews. He's a Shonda. It's a Shonda. I'm going to start using that. Unfortunately for Shonda Rhimes, I mean, her name is not a good meaning in Yiddish, Shonda. That's different, but. She's the only good Shonda. <laughs> what else? Sarah, I wanted you to know. Okay, I was listening to the last week's episode, mm-hmm. and there was a caller asking you about um, a cigarette a day and how that's possible. And you said, why did you glean that from me? Why not flossing? Mm-hmm. And I just want to let you know, P.S., no shame on that caller. I was a smoker. Quitting is tough. It's terrible. And I could never do what you do of making a daily cigarette the only cigarette I have. But I wanted to let you know that I did start flossing religiously because of you, specifically you. And I tell people now that death creeps in through the gums. Oh, my And gosh. oh, my God, Sarah, my teeth, they are so white. They are so strong. They're like they're like one of my favorite things about my person sometimes or at least about my smile so you rule thank you for making me a little bit healthier Woo! oh my gosh i'm so proud that makes me so happy if i can just get one person to floss that's probably not very impactful but still impactful isn't that a dental term i don't know impacted all right what else hi sarah what TV shows or movies have you turned down that have went on to be big successes? I can't think of any um, anything I turned down the role of, per se, that like went on to be a huge thing. But I will say I've, I got the script for Bridesmaids, read the title, Bridesmaids, and was like, pass. And of course, it's like definitely in my top five favorite comedies of all time. And then when John Hamm, who's an old friend of mine, he called me and was like, I'm doing this pilot for AMC. You should audition for it. There's like a role for this Jewish woman that owns a shopping center or something. And I was just like, "Uh, I have a show on an actual network called Comedy Central, but thanks anyway. I'll definitely check out your show on, what is it? American Movie Classics? (laughs) fucking asshole. I'm an asshole. I'm an asshole. We owe, we owe, we owe. It's a Dennis Leary reference. All right. What else? Hi, Sarah. This is Sarah. I am calling in regards to one of the voicemails that you received and you had commented saying basically that we should be tolerant. We being liberals. Um, We should tell people who may not have certain views as us, hey, there's room for you with us too. And um, I personally practice a zero tolerance policy. Um, I'm a woman of color and, you know, I've gone through a lot and I've been mistreated plenty of times by people where I just don't have the patience for it anymore. And I kind of refuse to even try to help people get to some sort of conclusion. Um, I kind of just look at it as that's up to them. So I guess my question for you is, is, you know, do you really think that everybody should exercise that amount of tolerance? Um, Even if it's just impacted them so negatively that they're tired of it. Um, So anyway, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, Love the podcast. You're amazing. Thanks so much. Bye. Yeah, no, no. You have a note from your doctor. (laughs) Women of color have a note from their doctor on this one. No, 
I absolutely do not think you owe anyone anything, especially amidst the exhaustion of uh, ignorance you likely experience. What I was, um, what I said was that it is, well, I, I said a couple things. One is I said it is absolutely not your job to teach um to, to reach out or educate these people, but if you were inclined to, it would be a mitzvah. Um, if you mean the what I said last week, which was um, when we were talking about, right, kind of like the black and whiteness, the hard line, the, the, um, the zero tolerance of the left, of which I reside, I just mean it doesn't uh, behoove us to be so closed to people who are trying or who are open or who are ideologically malleable, um, that these people are voters and we need them. You know, if they could be swayed toward a more uh, just society just by being engaged with, it, that it's worth it for if you've, if you've got the uh, gumption to. But no, that is absolutely not your job as an individual. Um, unless you truly have the the space and the desire for it. I mean, I would say that uh, the word I hear over and over from my girlfriends of color are uh, exhausted. I, I think the word I hear the most is fucking just exhausted. So I'm in a position where I have the privilege uh, of being less exhausted. So let people like me take that shit on seriously. This is, there's an ally thing we can do maybe. Um, but yeah, no, you don't, uh, owe that to anyone. That was just how I was thinking, you know, in terms of the left and getting people to see through our eyes, you know, um, is that a good answer? And with that, I will say, Dad, that's it. Podcast over. Winding down is an understatement. This is exactly the time where I say subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps us if you do that. Subscribe or uh, press the thumbs up thing or whatever the fuck. And if you like watching, if you're a visual type, you can watch this. A podcast on YouTube. So long. See you next week. Hey! Hey, I wanna f Hey! Hi! Hey, you fucker! Hey! Subscribe here so you don't miss an episode. And you can click here to watch the last episode if you missed it. <laughs>